right. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, so let us uh, carry on. Uh, and uh, we are looking at the uh, uh, Chula Dukkha Kanda Sutta on all the uh, heap of suffering uh, in the world. Uh, and we had just been looking at the idea that unless you attain uh, some kind of samadhi, some kind of jhana, which is apart from uh, sensual pleasures, beyond sensual pleasures, uh, the mind will incline towards it. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the main ideas here. Uh, and uh, this is what the Buddha has been saying. And now we, because all of these suttas are a bud about the Buddha's own life, now we will find the Buddha talking about his past experience with this. Yeah? So now we're moving on to uh, the Buddha talking about himself. Uh, and then he says again, as usual, before my awakening here, yeah, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, yeah, I too clearly saw with right wisdom that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering yeah, and distress, uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, yes, you see, he has seen this clearly. But so long as I didn't achieve the rapture and bliss that are apart from sensual pleasures uh, and unskillful qualities, uh, or something even more peaceful than that, uh, I didn't announce that I would not return to sensual pleasures. Uh, as long as you haven't gone beyond sensual pleasures, you cannot announce you will not return to them. Uh, kind of makes sense. You need to go beyond, you need to find something superior, then you can say, I will not go back to these things. Uh, but when I did achieve that rapture and bliss, or something more peaceful than that, I announced that I would not return to sensual pleasures. And again, the rapture and bliss that is talking about here is the bliss of jhana. Yeah, it's, it's because it uses the word kame, uh, anyatra kame, apart from karma, apart from unskillful qualities. It's exactly the same phrasing that you find in the first jhana. So that's how you know that he's talking about the jhanas right there. Uh, that's when he could make that announcement. And what is the gratification of sensual pleasures? Now we're going to look at sensual pleasure in terms of this uh, threefold scheme that we talk about. Uh, yeah, gratification, asada. You see the word asada down there? This is the gratification, in other words, the pleasure or the happiness and things. Uh, and then we're going to look at the adinava, which is the drawback or the downside. Uh, and then once you kind of weigh these things up, you look at the good part, the bad part, you weigh them up, then you, uh, if the bad part is bad, then you go for the nisarana, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of relinquishment, yeah, the giving up, the liberation from those uh, sensual pleasures. Uh, so this is what we're going to see now. But before we see that, I'm going to indulge in a bit of sensual pleasure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a hypocrite, right? This is hypocritical monks, really. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the whole of us in the pleasures, sir. <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, okay, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> now, you will notice here that the, uh, the way it is phrased, it says, kocha mahanama, yeah? Kamanang. You see the word kamanang over there? Yeah. That is another plural. The anang ending is a plural ending here. Yeah. And so what we're talking about here is we're talking about the gratification or the pleasure of the five senses, the five sense world. Uh, whenever karma is in the plural, it refers again to the five senses. So uh, what is the gratification of the five senses, you could argue, is perhaps some clearer translation of what is going on here. Huh? So what is that, right? So let's have a quick look at that. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, there are these five kinds of sensual stimulation, yeah, karma guna. In other words, the five kinds of senses. Uh, what five? Uh, sights known by the eye that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, uh, 
sensual and arousing here. Yeah. Sounds no, known by the ear, smells known by the nose, uh, tastes known by the tongue, yeah. touches known by the body that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual and arousing here. Yeah. These are the five kinds of sensual stimulation. Yeah, the five senses. Uh, that's basically what it is. Uh, you can see it right there. So this is what I was saying before. In the plural, it refers to the five senses. Uh, the pleasure and happiness that arises from these five kinds of sensual stimulation, this is the gratification of sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah, so very straightforward, uh, very easy. Whatever happiness comes through the five senses, uh, that is called the pleasure, the gratification, in case of the five senses. Uh, so we all know what that is. We don't really have to, you know, to kind of go in detail. It's a very varied and very large uh, field. Uh, there's a lot of kind of happinesses in that realm, uh, and uh, some of those happinesses are very kind of coarse and very agitating. They have a lot to do with craving. Uh, but some of the pleasures that come through the five senses are actually can be useful to lead you in the right direction. I think it's important to remember that the five senses are not all bad. Yeah, it depends on how we think about them. So the way to deal with the five senses is to start off with a kind of giving up the things that are really, that leads to all kind of immorality. Yeah, that leads to problems. That is the first thing. So keep the five precepts. By keeping the five precepts, you're already getting rid of the things that are the worst problems with the five senses. Uh, this is kind of the first kind of uh, initial thing here. Yeah. The other thing to remember is that um, sensual stimulation in, in the world, uh, often you get very agitated, very restless uh, by the five senses. Uh, yeah, sometimes the craving can be very strong. Uh, sometimes just being in the world just makes you agitated because you have to run around and do things all the time. Uh, so we can use uh, the five senses and use the happiness that comes to that also for calming down. Yeah, so we kind of use, we understand the varying degrees to which these five senses are, involves us with craving and attachments. So when, for example, you have had a long day at work or a long day with whatever and you feel tired or whatever, you can use a refined kind of sensual stimulation to calm down. You can listen to some chanting, you can listen to some calming music, yeah. Don't listen to heavy metal music, yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be, be not so good, yeah. Techno, techno, not so good. Techno is too exciting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some calming kind of music, yeah. And, uh, and you listen to something calm, it calms you. Have a nice cup of tea, yeah. Have a nice cup of coffee, yeah. That's what I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sit in your favorite chair just to relax. This is actually sensual stimulation, but it's a refined kind of sensual stimulation. It doesn't take you too far away, and it kind of helps you to calm down, get rid of most of the restlessness of the mind. Uh, so we use the world of the five senses uh, in a good way to kind of lead you in the right direction, right? And it's fascinating, this also happens for the monastics. You know, one of the things that monastics are allowed to enjoy and to kind of delight in uh, is nature. Uh, you see this in the Theragata, Therigata, the ancient scriptures of the monastics. Uh, they would go off into the forest and they would say, wow, these mountains are so beautiful. Look at the beautiful forest. Look at the peacocks. You know the peacocks, right? Be beautiful birds. Uh, and look at the kind of the, the uh, eagles soaring above, yeah, on the, kind of on the current. And they would actually admire nature and admire these things. Uh, and the reason is because nature doesn't really lead to a lot of attachment. Uh, when you are in nature, you are just there, but you don't really feel very attached to it. Uh, but it does calm you down, uh, because it is away from the sensual stimulations of the world. Uh. So the idea here is to understand the various types of five sense experience uh, and uh, move towards something more refined. Uh, you can do this in your daily life. Uh, when you're tired, to, to, you know, instead of going, coming back home and trying to meditate straight away, calm down gradually, because you cannot make these quantum leaps. Yeah? or from being agitated, bang, straight to being peaceful. It doesn't work like that. The mind is gradual. The mind gradually calms down. It doesn't do quantum leaps. Only quantum mechanics does quantum leaps. And this is not about quantum mechanics. This is about something else. <laughs> so uh, that is the right way. Yeah? And then you kind of gradually move in the right direction. 
this is a good way to thinking about sensual pleasure. It's not all bad. It's kind of varies enormously. Yeah. So uh, then you start to deal with these things in a in a kind of a useful way. So uh, there's all kinds of different kinds of pleasure. Hey, go for the more refined pleasures if you can, because uh, they are more conducive for um, the spiritual practice. So. Okay, so now we have seen the um, the pleasure or the gratification in the five senses. Now we're going to look at the downside, the drawback in the case of the five senses. Uh, and you will, as you will see, it is very straightforward what these drawbacks are. Yeah. What is the drawback uh, of sensual pleasures, uh, or the five senses? Uh, is when a gentleman, or a gentlewoman, or a gentle person uh, earns a living by means such as computing, accounting, uh, calculating, farming, trade, raising cattle, uh, archery, government service, uh, or one of the professions. Yeah, whatever profession you're in, uh, that is your by that by which you earn your living here. But they must face cold and heat, uh, being hurt by the touch of flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and reptiles, uh, and risking death from hunger and thirst. This is the drawback of sensual pleasures apparent in this very life a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. Or you could say caused by the five senses. Yeah, This has to do with the five senses again. I would say much better to call it caused by the five senses than caused by sensual pleasures. It's more kind of immediately understandable. Yeah. So uh, what is the point of this? Well, the point of this is that uh, all of these things are small. This may seem like small things, right? Cold and heat. Uh, but we are always complaining about the cold and the heat. Isn't that true? I was complaining the other day. I said, please turn on the aircon. So I was complaining just the other day. Yeah? And sometimes I see some of you, maybe you get too cold when the aircon is too cold. I like very cold aircon because I'm Norwegian. And Norwegians, we like kind of the cold and the ice. <laughs> but uh, I too sometimes, actually I've been in Australia for so long now, I, I start to get cold when I, you know, it gets, gets too cold. And the heat can be terrible in Australia. If you think it's hot in Malaysia, you haven't been to Australia yet. Much, much hotter in Australia <laughs> than in Malaysia. Yeah, recently between 35 and 40 degrees, uh, and the sun is like zzz, like this. Yeah, it's not like it's not like kind of uh, humid. It's kind of really dry heat in Australia. Last year we had one week. Every day was over 40 degrees for one whole week. Yeah, and you think you're going to die at the end of that. You think you you really actually you want to die at the <laughs> end of all of that. <laughs> it is so so painful. So. These things are real. They are real problems, right? Cold and heat. And of course, if you have to live a living like this, and especially at that time in India, there was no air con. Yeah? You had to be outside. The heat was kind of searing. And you just had to deal with it somehow. Huh? But we all know that this is unpleasant. Huh? And then you have the idea of all the little insects, right? Uh, all the serpents and all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah? Do you have mosquitoes here in Malaysia? Huh? Yeah? Everywhere in the world, mosquitoes, right? Uh, if you in, uh, and <laughs> everywhere is mosquito. You can't get away from mosquitoes. Uh, and if you have a mosquito at night in your room, uh, can you sleep? Uh, this mosquito is buzzing. Bzzz, uh, <laughs> very hard to sleep, right? Uh, and it's kind of stupid because what can the mosquito do? It can give you a small little bite, and then you can't sleep. It's kind of silly, but somehow it plays with our psychology, and we can't deal with that. Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. So. Uh, all of these things are irritants in our life. And sometimes we are so used to it, we don't actually think that it is a problem. Huh? And this is kind of one of those strange things that anyone who has a, attains a deep state of samadhi, huh? you will understand after coming out of a state of samadhi how irritating the body is. Yeah? You never even understand it before because you're always there. The body is always here, always irritating you, pain here, pain there little kind of, you know, tensions or whatever. And then when you let go of the body, wow, so blissful. And then you come back to the body again. I think, oh no, I don't want to come back to this, bo <laughs> this body again. Yeah? The body is a heap of pain. That's basically the body. And, and the Buddha actually says that in the suttas. This body is like this precipice. It's like this um, abyss of pain. There's no end to the pains of the body. And sometimes we're not even aware of that. 
And so this is the pain that has to do with the five senses. Yeah, it's simple things, uh, but we have to sometimes we have to reflect and stand back to see that these things actually are problems. Uh, the wind, the sun, yeah, the sun is being too hot. Uh, reptiles, uh, and you're risking death from hunger and thirst. Uh, okay, I don't know about these days. Have you ever risked death because of hunger and thirst? Uh, so, <laughs> Oh, because you had to drive to the restaurant? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had to drive, drive to the five star rest, driving to the five star restaurant. Yeah, that's really risky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, but um, it's quite not so common. But I think there's more hunger in the world now than there was uh, recently. Things are getting worse again, uh, more difficult with secu food security. Yeah, so things are kind of going in that direction. Uh. And uh, what about you, Vendor? Well, have you ever risked hunger and hunger and thirst as a monastic? Yeah. Ne never risk that. Okay, yeah. so always people there. The Thai people are so generous to monastics, right? Uh, so you cannot risk any hunger and thirst. Uh. It's, in fact, it's the opposite problem. In mass. Too much food. That's the problem, right? Uh. If you look downstairs, downstairs, like you know, today, there's, there's enough food for ten monks there. And I, where are the other monks? I can't. They're not, they're not there. <laughs> so it is very beautiful. It's one of those uh, very touching things to be a monastic. Is that people are usually very kind to you, and very, very supportive, and very generous. Uh, and uh, it's very dangerous as a monastic to take it for granted. Uh, but actually, it's a very beautiful thing. Uh, and if you think about those things in the right way, it actually is very uplifting. Uh, because you see the goodness in the world, you see the goodness is there. So always have your eyes open for the goodness in other people, uh, because it always is around you if you look, know how to look in the right place. So. Anyway, back to the sutta. So this is an obvious kind of a problem with the five senses. Uh, and please notice that when you have a little bit of success in your meditation practice uh, and your body starts to fade away, notice how delightful that is. Part of that delight Part of that happiness comes precisely because the five senses are fading away. That is why you feel happy and at ease. It's a very large part of it. It may seem bleeding obvious, right? But actually the Buddha has to tell us these things for us to really reflect on these things properly. Yeah. Okay. This is the drawback. Yeah. Then comes the second one. Yeah. That gentleman, that gentlewoman, that gentle person yeah might try hard, strive and make an effort, but fail to make any money. If this happens, they sorrow, wail and lament, beating the breast and falling into confusion, saying, Oh, my hard work is wasted. My efforts are fruitless. Has that ever happened to you? You work really hard in the company. The boss doesn't see you. Has that ever happened? You feel you're putting so much hard effort, uh, no one appreciates what you're doing here. Uh. Isn't that always like that? Uh? Yeah, not always like that, but sometimes like that. Uh. You work really hard and they see someone else, they see someone who's a real scallywag, uh, but they know, they know how to endear themselves to the boss, right? They are kind of this dodgy character. All they do is endearing themselves. They don't actually do any hard work. They get the promotion, they get the raise, but you don't get it. Uh, it's true, isn't it? Uh, Life is often like that. Life is often unfair. And sometimes you just have to deal with the unfairness because that is the nature of life. Never expect life to be fair. If you expect life to be fair, you're going to suffer. Guaranteed. So this is the thing here, right? You work really hard. It doesn't pay off. This is what happened. There's no guarantee that your hard work will pay off. This is unfortunately the nature of the world. And so many people get angry and upset because of these things. This too is a drawback of sensual pleasures, apparent in this very life, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasure. And of course the problem here, again, and this is a problem with all of the sensual world, is that we share that world with other people. And when we share the world with other people, it means that we are not really the boss in that world. We're not in charge. We rely on what other people do. Yeah? We depend on other people whether we are going to be happy or not. And that is the dip, one of the important differences between the spiritual life and the worldly life. The worldly life is always shared with others. And we are subject to, we are trapped by how other people treat us and what they do to us. 
When it comes to the spiritual life, you are in charge. It only has to do with you. It has to do with your conduct. It has to do with your inner life. It has to do with how you think. It has to do with how you still yourself in meditation. Other people have no say in that thing. And this is why the spiritual life is more satisfactory, because you have a greater sense of control, if you like. Maybe control is the wrong word, but you have more effect over that life than you have over the life outside. That gentleman, that gentlewoman, that gentle person uh, might try hard, strive and make an effort uh, and succeed in earning money. So even if you succeed, it's bad, right? This is the next one here. Huh? Even if you succeed, there's a problem here. Huh? But they experience pain and sadness when they try to protect it. Thinking, how can I prevent my wealth from being taken by the rulers or the bandits or consumed by fire? swept away by a flood, or taken by unloved heirs. And even though they do protect it and ward it, rulers or bandits still take it. Fire still consumes it, or flood sweeps it away, or unloved heirs take it away. Yeah? This is true, isn't it? One of the big kind of... Uh, Anxieties of people is to look after their property. Yeah, make sure you lock the door of the apartment, otherwise the burglars are going to come. Do we have enough locks? Is it safe enough? Are, is anyone going to steal it? Make sure the car is locked. Don't park the car in a dangerous place. Have you got your wallet with you? Where, what's going on? Always concerned about the things that we own, right? I know what it is like. This is kind of the, the nature of this world. It is like that. And sometimes I'm worried about my computer, so I know exactly the feeling yeah, where maybe someone is going to take it because I have all these valuable things on my computer, like my translation work is there. I'm attached to my translation. Uh, so uh, this is how it goes. Yeah, It is painful to be worried about our things in the world. It's painful to be worried about that, trying to protect it, thinking about it, being concerned about it. Uh, it is always the same. And even if you try your hardest to look after things, still you are not sure that it actually will work out. And usually what happens if that, you know, if the kings uh, or, the, or the taxes get taken or the bandits rob your apartment or the fire burns down your house, as it happens in Australia sometimes, what you then think, again, you tend to think the wrong thing. What you think is, what could I have done better to avoid that? That's what you think, yeah? Or I should have been more, I should have sprinkler system in my house. I should have cleared the leaves from the gutters of the house. That's why it burned down, yeah? I didn't have enough locks on my apartment. That's why it got burgled. You're learning the wrong thing from what is happening. That is not what you should learn. You shouldn't learn to think that the reason is because you didn't do it right. That's actually the wrong lesson. There may be something to that, but that's only a small part of it, because even if you had more locks, even if you did clear those leaves of your house, still your house would burn down eventually. Still your apartment would eventually get burgled, because that's what burglars do. Huh? So the real lesson, instead of trying to find the solution in that realm, is to remember this is the nature of things. You cannot hold on to things. You do your best. But you don't go over the top with anxiety because you know it is the nature of the world for things to go. Don't have anything expensive in your apartment. That's the best thing, right? Just have four bare walls, then you'll be fine. Sleep on the floor. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm being silly. I'm just being naughty now. So uh, don't do that because then you have a miserable life. Make sure you have a, have a, have a nice life. Yeah. <laughs> but this is basically the nature of the world, that you cannot hold on to things. And certainly when you die, that starts to become very, very obvious. So. They sorrow, wail, and lament, beating their breast, falling into confusion. What used to be mine is gone. Yeah, what used to be mine is gone. Now, what is the, can you see what the problem is there? The problem is that it was never yours in the first place. That's the problem. You thought it was yours. You forgot that everything you have is actually borrowed goods. It comes into your life and then it disappears. Uh, the idea of mine is a delusion. It is an illusion. Nothing is really yours. Uh, it comes, it arises, and when time has come to pass away, it will go again. Uh, 
You cannot control these things. And this is why the Buddha has this beautiful idea of the simile of borrowed goods. Understanding things in your life to be borrowed is a far better attitude to have to them. If you don't think of things as mine, then you will not be surprised when it's gone. It wasn't mine anyway, okay, it's gone. Fine, no worries. It's, it's true. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. That's excellent. Now I shall remember. Borrowed computer, borrowed computer. Okay, borrowed. <laughs> so, uh, this is what you have fellow monastics, because they dare to tell you straight to your face what the problem is. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. I don't have a borrowed spouse, that's true, yeah, okay. So we have borrowed core monastics instead, that's true. So they, uh, they take that job, okay? So this too is a drawback of the five senses apparent in this very life, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. You will notice here apparent in this very life, that is an important one, because the Buddha always divides things up into what you can see immediately, what is kind of, uh, you can know for yourself, and then, of course, there are the um, consequences that come in future lives. That's also part of this. We'll come to that further down. Uh, but so far, we're dealing with what is apparent right here and now. Uh, the mass of suffering caused by the five senses. Okay, let's do a little bit of uh, meditation.
Okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, all right, any comments or questions by anyone? Uh, Jen. Hello. <laughs> kids, kid, kids or not kids? <laughs> yeah, kids. Yeah, kids. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when faced with unfairness, like in the class, unfairness. And unfairness in class. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you you said about working hard and all right. So like my girl, she did she did her part lah in class, but she was not given that recognition. So. How do I guide them? I told her if you have that expectation, you'll always be disappointed. Yeah. So I cannot tell her not to have because kids are kids. Yeah. Adults also, we do have expectations. So how, how do we balance? Okay, well, I think you balance by, f first of all, just let them know that. Let them know that the world is unfair. Yeah, they don't expect the world to be fair because it is, isn't fair. Yeah. The fairness doesn't exist, it's very random. But what you can tell her is that um, in the long run, it will be recognized. Yeah? In the short run, there will be that times when it's not recognized. Uh, but if she keeps on doing the right thing in the long run, uh, overall, it will be recognized. Because usually, good work is recognized, uh, but not always. Uh, and so you just have to tell her that, okay, keep on going, and eventually it will be okay. Uh, maybe this particular teacher is no good, and next year you have a different teacher, it will be different, for example, uh, yeah? or whatever it is. Uh, so something like that, uh, and uh, that, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, and the, the other thing I think that is important is uh, to also, again, this is, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do here, we're trying to shift the attention away from the external world to the inner world, uh, and in the inner life, uh, and everything good you do is always recognized, uh, because you recognize it, uh, yeah? So if you live more, instead of living for recognition by external people, which is always going to be uncertain, uh, you do something which you know yourself you can recognize. That is, in other words, to live with kindness, to live with care, to live with compassion. You, you will always gain the benefit from that, uh, regardless. Uh, because she will know, you will know, when you are kind and you will feel good about yourself as a consequence. That recognition will always be there. Uh. It's difficult with kids because they're still very young and it's hard for them to see these things, but you, kind of, you can sow the little seeds, you know, and then over time it will kind of come and eventually they will have some success with these kind of things, hopefully. Yeah. So, and see what, see what happens, uh, yeah. And uh, it's in one way, it's interesting with children and that age, you know, 13 or whatever it is, uh, on the one hand they can be very smart and sharp, like, like yesterday the question was quite a quite a sharp question, yeah, why should I say thank you and I don't feel gratitude, you know? On the one hand, they can be very intelligent, but on the other hand, they're also still very immature at the same time. Uh, they have this kind of, it's a double-edged sword, uh, and uh, you know the right answer, but sometimes it can be hard to tell them the right answer because they use their sharp mind to kind of circumvent the, the, <laughs> the right answer, uh, and that <laughs> makes life difficult. Yeah. Based on your reply yesterday, I brought it back to her. Mm. She used the salt in the lake uh, simile. Because mm. I said, uh, Ajahn said, you have to be polite. Mm. Um, so I asked her, uh, uh, Ajahn said, you don't need to have gratitude in saying thank you. Yeah. But she said, the whole point of thank you is because I feel grateful. So I asked her, in the whole time with that teacher, wasn't there one act of goodness? Uh, warrants a thank you. Yeah. Then she used that simile. Mommy is like the salt in the lake. It's not enough one egg, <laughs> one good egg, <laughs> to cover all the yeah. other <laughs> ugly eggs. Yeah. So I say I'll ask Arjun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, no, we should, we should, we should have gratitude for even the smallest things in the world. It's good to have gratitude for even the small things. Uh, I remember the uh, Venerable Sariputta, there's a very there's a story in the Vinaya Pitaka about a man who wanted to become a monk. Yeah? And then the Buddha asks the monks, well, should we, give, should we ordain this man or not? He was a Brahmin. And they all went, nah, we should ordain him, he's very stingy, he's a bad person. Huh? 
And then, and then they uh, asked, uh, when the Bosari put on, I said, oh, I remember one occasion, one occasion, uh, he put some food in my arms bowl. Uh, yeah? And then the Buddha praised him. That is what the people who have gratitude do. They remember one single occasion, uh, yeah? because it is so beautiful. So remember the good qualities in people. When you remember, the, even if it's only one occasion, uh, that's good enough. Uh, yeah? Because that is a beautiful way of looking at other people, rejoicing in their good qualities. Uh, so that is uh, that is the, that is always has to be like that. And the other thing to remind your daughter is that it's very difficult to know other people. Huh? We don't really know them. Huh? All we see is we see the person filtered through our own perception. Huh? She sees that teacher in one way. Someone else may see the teacher in a different way. Huh? Yeah, we don't actually know the person. So when you see something good, always rejoice in that. Hold on to that huh? because it is uh, something beautiful to to hold on to into the war in the world. Huh? And so, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, she's young. You, you have to allow her to be a bit rebellious. Young people want to be rebellious. Don't try too hard to, to convince her otherwise. Yeah, just shrug your shoulders and say whatever. Yeah, just uh, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Because sometimes they will just keep on arguing until you, you, you get exhausted, right? And then uh, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be hopeless anyway. And Ajahn so, will be exhausted too <laughs> with the questions. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the way you said that just let the child be rebellious. Um, I would like to... I, I'm very touched that this sister is so committed to to be a good mother and a good parent. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I, I would like to also mention that perhaps you're trying a bit too hard, sister. <laughs> I think you are a very good parent already. Just, yeah. just be good yeah. enough. Um, another thing I would like to highlight is probably um, to be a parent parenting skill we, we can't we can't uh, learn parenting parenting skill all from Buddhism uh, there are very practical parenting skills that you you can look at like how to deal with your child's emotion you know if the child come back very upset and say that I say thank you and people don't appreciate it you may want to say that oh Oh, it is awful, right? You know, you just just uh, uh, acknowledge that she feels awful. Uh, just so that's compassion. And um, I think yesterday somebody mentioned about mindful, mindful kids, mindful team. Uh, <laughs> I hope BGF will start. I um, I actually created the program with uh, Sister May and May Mian on mindful team. Mm. Um, yeah, it deals a lot with emotion. Of course, it's based on mindfulness. And also, there's mindful parenting too that uh, that Sister May is doing. So I hope it can it can kind of help all this um, all these parents who who really want to do good. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Thank sada, you. Sada, sada. Great. That's good. So there you are. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's true. Sometimes it's also it's better to ask someone else who is a parent rather than a monk who has no idea. <laughs> 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 so you know, that's kind of. A, so that's always useful. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, please, Bobby. Yeah, dear Chan. Dear Chan, of all the f five sensual desires, yeah, what would be the major one that uh, most people need to encounter? Because, like, like uh, I understand, yeah, a lot of monastics are uh, destroyed because of a uh, woman <laughs> attraction to opposite. So yeah. I guess it's the same for lay people. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it is not, I mean, you're talking about sex and that kind of thing, obviously. Yeah. But uh, it's not that the sexuality is bad. You know, Buddhism doesn't have that kind of idea that sexuality is bad. This is very much a Christian kind of thing, comes with Christianity. Buddhism doesn't have that kind of moralizing. Yeah. But uh, w what I would say, that it's not, so it's not like one particular sensual pleasure that is kind of worse. I mean, Sexuality is bad because often the craving can be very strong and that can be very very agitated and that sort of thing. That is kind of the downside. Uh, but uh, what really is bad is not that. But what is bad is when you become unkind because in your pursuit of sensual pleasures. Uh, so I would say that critical thing is to be kind. And if you can be kind at all times, uh, that is if, if a certain sensual pleasure stops you from being kind, yeah? For example, you are so keen on your career, you don't care if you hurt other people in the pursuit of your career. Or you are so keen on, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, on, 
on whatever that you kind of have extramarital affairs and these kind of things. Yeah, if you break your precepts in the pursuit of sensual pleasures, that is a problem. So I would say just be kind. And if you are kind consistently all the time, uh, that will put a bound on the sensual pleasures you can enjoy here. Uh, yeah? That will put a natural bound on it. Uh, and that bound is good enough for most people. Uh. So that's what I would say. But uh, th th there's no need to kind of cut out any particular sensual pleasures uh, in ordinary life. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, shall we? Let's carry on a little bit. Uh. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next uh, uh, disadvantage or drawback. Furthermore, uh, for the sake of sensual pleasures, kings fight with kings. Uh, aristocrats fight with aristocrats. Uh, Brahmins fight with Brahmins. Uh, householders fi fight with householders. Uh, Mother fights with her child, a child with her mother, with its mother. Father with child, child with father. Brother fights with brother, brother with sister, sister with brother. Friends fight with friends. Yeah, Anyone fights with anyone. That's, I guess, kind of the bottom line here. <laughs> and uh, this is true, isn't it? Uh, we fight over things in the world. We disagree about things. And whenever we fight, it is almost always about sensual pleasures. Uh, there's one other reason why we fight, apart from sensual pleasures, uh, and that has to do with ego, with our sense of self. Yeah? This is the other thing. Yeah? But sensual pleasures is a big one, uh, and that is often we want the same things in the world. We are kind of competing over scarce resources, as I said before, uh, and that, com that competition over scarce resources means that we argue, we fight, uh, and we kind of cause all kinds of problems because of that. Uh. <coughs> um, kings fight with kings. Yeah, I want your kingdom too. My kingdom is not big enough. Uh, There's kind of a nice uh, sutta. This is the Ratapala Sutta. Have you? Do you know the Ratapala Sutta? Uh, beautiful sutta. Yeah, I recommend you to read it. Uh, and uh, at the end of the Ratapala Sutta, it has what they call the four summaries of the Dhamma. It's, it's in the middle length sayings of the Buddha number 82 in the, in the middle length sayings, Rat Ratapala Sutta. And Ratapala is this young man who goes forth and becomes a monastic. Yeah. And then uh, uh, later on in his life, he comes back to his uh, home town uh, and he meets the king of that hometown. Uh, and uh, he teaches the king what is called the four summaries of the Dhamma, very beautiful summaries that kind of really encompass the Dhamma in a very beautiful way. Yeah. And uh, one of those summaries is that uh, the world is a slave to craving. Uh, the world is insatiate. There's no satisfaction in the world. The world is a slave to craving. Uh, and then the king asked Ratapala, what do you mean by that? This is the summary of the Dhamma, right? A slave to craving. Uh, the king asked him, what do you mean by that? And then Ratapala says, well, let me ask you in, in return, great king, uh, if there is a man who comes from the east, uh, and the man says to you, there's a big kingdom in the east, lots of gold and silver, elephants and cattle, all this wealth, uh, but uh, it is not protected very well. You can, you can take it if you wish. Uh, what would you do, great king? And the king says, of course, we would take it, we would conquer it. <laughs> of course, right? It's obvious, isn't it? Uh, he said, well, why even ask the question? It's kind of, you know, it's, uh, and if another man came from the south, from the north, from the west, from overseas, what would he do? Oh, we'll take that as well, huh? And then he says, well, that's what we mean. The world is insatiate. It doesn't matter how large your kingdom is. If you can get larger, you will take it. And I always ask myself, where is the limit? What, what if you own the whole earth? What next? Well, after the earth, you will want Mars, right? Then you will want Venus. Then you will want the next solar system. Then you will want the whole galaxy. One galaxy, not enough. Nowhere near enough. Okay, the next galaxy, the supercluster, 1,000 galaxies, not sufficient, right? The whole universe. Well, what if you have the whole universe? And this is my theory. My theory is that, you know, they, these days they have this idea of multiple universes. Have you heard of the multiverse? Yeah? This is why the multiverse was invented, because it was not enough with one universe, right? <laughs> the greed was so large, you want more universes, so even more universes without end. 
And this is the problem with craving. And the reason why craving has this problem uh, is because craving can never be satisfied. Uh. It, doesn't, it can never be satisfied by having more. It's always going to go further. Uh. Uh, and for that reason, that actually there is no limit to the idea uh, for you know, what you can crave for. Uh. And so this is really the problem here. This is the issue, is this idea that you are insatiate. Satiation, satisfaction doesn't happen in that world. It happens somewhere else. It happens within by practicing and thinking in the right way. So it goes on. Kings fight with kings. Yeah? More and more. Yeah, I want what you have. You know, don't take what I have. And then you fight and all of these kind of things. And the world is full of this. And uh, when you see many of the wars that happen in the world, uh, they happen for these kind of reasons. Uh, yeah, uh, some of the wars in the Middle East, I think, are wars over oil. Yeah, I want to control the resources of oil in the world. I think that is often at least a part of it. That is sensual pleasures. I don't know. It's interesting. What about the war in Ukraine? Is that a war for sensual pleasures? I think maybe a little bit, but I think also it has to do with identity, the sense of self. Yeah, I think this idea that, uh, you know, when you hear what the uh, some of these leaders say, like Vladimir Putin, he says, this is the natural backyard of Russia. This belongs to us. There's a feeling that this is ours already. This, we, we deserve this, right? And this has to do more with a sense of self, perhaps, than the thing. So you can see that these wars and these problems, they arise from these two things, sense objects and the sense of self, the, the idea. This is kind of where almost everything can be analyzed back to those two things. Okay, connecting, connecting, it says over here. Yeah. Connecting, connecting, here. Yeah. Ah, I think I lost my internet connection. No, it's still there. Okay. Ooh. Oh, okay. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Ding. Okay. So, <laughs> let's go on to the next one. Okay, no. Okay, here we go. Once they started quarreling, arguing, and disputing, they attack each other with fists, stones, rods, and swords, uh, resulting in death or deadly pain. Uh, this too is a drawback of sensual pleasures apparent in this very life, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. This is the thing that we saw before in that sutta on the, uh, uh, the Atadanda Sutta, yeah, the taking up of uh, punishment and, uh, and weapons and arms that we saw before. Uh, this idea that the world is always fighting, there's no place, you cannot get away from the fighting and the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, conflict in the world. It's, it's kind of, it's built into the world. It's built into sensual pleasures. And that's why it's called a mass of suffering, because it's always around, always lurking in the background, waiting to come out in the future again. It's like the cause and conditions are building up behind the scenes. You can't see it happening. And then it emerges out, uh, yeah? And then you have these conflicts happening in the world. Uh, it's like no one could see the war in Ukraine coming. But behind the scenes, it was building up, building up, and then suddenly it reaches a critical momentum and it comes out. Uh, and everything in the world is a bit like that. Uh. Okay. Furthermore, for the sake of sensual pleasures, they don their sword and shield. Don is like put on. Fasten their bow and arrows and plunge into the battle. M battle massed on both sides, with arrows and spears flying and swords flashing. Yeah. Sounds like some kind of movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where there they are struck with arrows and spears, their heads are chopped off, uh, resulting in death or deadly suffering. Well, I think if your head is chopped off, it's more than deadly suffering or deadly pain. I think you, uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> Now, this too is a drawback of sensual pleasures apparent in this very life, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes you have no choice. You, ha you get sent into war whether you want to or not. Uh. 
What happens in Mal if Malaysia goes to war? Does what happens then? Who has to go to war? Huh? Is there any? So, oh, on the army. But what if the army is not big enough? Then they you have to get you have to get reservists. You have, is that is that drafting people right? Uh, yeah, the men, not the women. But what if the men is not enough? Uh? I, <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting because in in some countries they have they have the uh, draft a military service also for women. Yeah, like in Israel, Israel they also have a military for women. So if the men is not enough, the women have to go. Uh, not safe just because you're a woman, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to bring out the dhamma here. Uh, and then if you are, even if you're old, if everyone else is used up, they take the old people as well, right? Uh, even, even if you are over 60, they say, okay, only, not 70 yet? Okay, come, you, you, we're going <laughs> to take you in there. And so the, um, yeah, anyway, so this is kind of uh, what happens. We think there's not going to be a war, but before you know it, there's a war. Uh, yeah. who, is in, who is Malaysia most likely to go to war with? Uh? What is the most likely country? Uh? Singapore? <laughs> Your victim? Which, who, who is the aggressor? The US. the US and China. It's true, isn't it? It is, it is the big, when the big powers go into conflict, all the small countries suffer as a consequence. It's true, isn't it? The whole world suffers when the big powers get into conflict. It is very true. So we should go, we should go to the big powers and tell them off. It's like, <laughs> You get your head chopped off if you do that. <laughs> it's worth, maybe it's worth it. Uh, yeah. What was that? Missile, yeah. But me <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is not a joke. You, you, th you think you you think it's a joke? It's not a joke. Yeah. There, there was a, there's a story with um, back in the time of when Ajahn Brahm was in Thailand, he was the disciple of Ajahn Shah, and there was because that time there was the Vietnam War was going on, yeah, and Thailand was also partly involved with the Vietnam War, and there was problems in Cambodia, of course, and all these kind of things, and there was a monk who was drafted by the army, yeah? and so he went to Ajahn Shah, said, "I'm a monk. What should I do? I'm drafted by the army." Ajahn Shah said, "You should go." Yeah. And he said, well, what if they ask me to shoot someone? He says, just aim, aim above the head. Yeah? <laughs> so that's kind of, so it's not, it's not a joke. Yeah? If you are a monastic, yeah, then still they may draft you into the army. So this is actually, this happens. Uh, so I, not the nuns. Uh. Whoa, that's the, uh, <laughs> this is called deni denial. This is called denial. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to hear about reality. So this is what the Buddha said. Denial is no good. Eh? <laughs> okay. But anyway, yeah, you can see how these things are. Actually, they're much more real than we think they are. We think the world is peaceful until suddenly there is no peace anymore. Eh? Maybe S Switzerland is supposed to be neutral, right? Eh? For how long? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's been neutral for, what is it, 800 years or something like that? Eh? Because a long, long way back, yeah. Even though one day it's going to come to an end, right? We just don't know when it's going to be here. When there's no money, <laughs> when the banks collapse, that's when Switzerland is going to have a, have a problem. <laughs> and the point is that everything is unreliable. Everything is uncertain. Everything is subject to change. We don't know what's going to happen. That's really the point here. And so this is what, hap this is, uh, what happens. So uh, that is all the um, things to do with the... Uh, Present life is that r right? Uh, Why Is that the, the last one? I, I don't have that book in front of me now. Uh, next, is that the end? Is that the end of the present life? Uh, one, one more paragraph, really? Uh, is that the paragraph on? For, furthermore, okay, for the sake of sensual pleasures, they don their sword and shields, fasten their bow and arrows, and charge wetly plastered bastions. Is that the one? With arrow, arrows. And swords flying and swords flashing. No, that's, oh, you can keep it one. That's okay. I only need that one there. You can go already. Yeah. Feeling, sleepy. feeling sleepy. Okay, so you're following my, my instructions to kind of. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll borrow it then. Very good. Huh? I don't tell enough jokes, obviously. You're falling asleep, so I gotta. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so you wetly plastered bastions with arrows and spears flying and swords flashing. Yeah. There they are struck with arrows and spears, splashed with dung, crushed with spiked blocks, blocks. Wow, this is kind of spare scary, isn't it? Uh, and the heads are chopped off, result in death or deadly suffering, yeah. or death-like suffering. Yeah. This too is a drawback of sensual pleasures apparent in, the, in this very life, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. Yeah. Mm, no, it wasn't there. That, that one wasn't there. That's a, this is an additional one. Huh? Yeah. yeah, down. So th that's what I meant. This was the last one in the present life. The next one is the future life, you see? Yeah. Future life, future life. All right, anyway. So, so now we have looked at all the ones that have to do with the present life. Uh, and of course, once that comes to the end, then comes the problem of sensual pleasures relating to the future life. Uh, Furthermore, for the sake of sensual pleasures, uh, they conduct themselves badly by way of body, speech and mind. When the body breaks up after death, they are reborn in a place of loss, uh, a bad place, the underworld in hell. So this is the big one, right, from sensual pleasures. Uh, and is this, we ha there's a tendency for people in the world to behave badly because of sensual pleasures. Uh, if you look at the large part of the bad things that happen in the world, the bad things that people do, actually it is related to sensual pleasures in one way or another. Sometimes also related to the sense of self, but very often related to sensual pleasures. We do bad things. And the less idea you have of the consequences in the future, like the ideas of rebirth or whatever, and all of these things, and how these things have a very long-term bad effect, the less you have that kind of idea, the more likely you are to focus on the pleasures in this life being the important thing. Yeah? And regardless of what you have to do to secure the pleasures in this life, uh, you will do that, even if it is doing bad things. Why? Because this is visible here and now. This is all I've got. This is what the meaning of life. You have no sense of the broader vision of reality. Uh, and this is very dangerous. Uh, but once you open up your mind to this broader vision of reality, uh, once you start reading some of the stories of near-death experiences, uh, once you hear about children having the eye, me memories of past lives, uh, once you get the feeling for what this feels like, uh, once you start maybe have these experiences yourself even, yeah, and you see that broader thing, you come back, you never are the same person afterwards. Uh, you understand the limited appeal of the worldly pleasures of this life. You understand the limited appeal of that uh, because you know the reality is far, far greater. You become more kind when you see the world in that way. Uh, and this is this idea that uh, having a feeling for rebirth actually makes you a better person. Uh, I find it very astonishing sometimes you hear about some of these secular Buddhists uh, and they say, oh, it doesn't matter, you don't have to believe in rebirth because being moral is good regardless. Uh, and that the truth is uh, that if you have an idea of the great expanse of life, it has a far more powerful effect on morality than just focusing on this life. Uh, yeah, it really enhances that. Uh, and this is why, as I said before, you find people having these near-death experiences and they come back and they are transformed as people uh, because they understand more about that larger reality. Uh, you would never do anything bad simply so that you can get more in this life. Because I want a bigger apartment, I want a bigger car than the neighbor. Yeah, the neighbor has a BMW, it's only five series, I want a seven series BMW, whatever it is. I don't know what the, these numbers are these days. But uh, uh, So, yeah, we become really, really stupid about these things in this world that actually are not that valuable. Uh, and then we start to think about life in an entirely different way. And this is this idea, again, of enhancing uh, the spiritual life, understanding the danger in these things. Never do anything bad in this life uh, in the pursuit of the limited things that belong to this world. Uh, if you do something bad in the pursuit of what belongs to this world, uh, there's only one guarantee for you. You're going to regret it when you die. Uh, on your deathbed, you're going to say, wow, 
all of these things I have to give up. Now I'm dying. All I take with me is the bad karma that I made in the pursuit of those things that I have to give up anyway. You can see how crazy that is, right? You, everything has to go. Everything, and all you bring with you is the bad conscience, the remorse, the regret of having done bad things in this life. Everything else has to go. It's kind of only on your deathbed you understand how crazy that is and how you have let yourself down and destroyed your own life because of your own lack of vision, your own lack of confidence in the teachings of the Buddha, or whatever else it might be. So this is really what this is about and why this is so important. And of course this is really the big one. It's bad enough in this life, but the consequences for the future are even greater. And I can guarantee you that if you keep on being attached to the sensory realm, eventually you will do at least some bad things in the pursuit of sensual things. Because that is just the nature of the human mind. Yeah? Sometimes it seems so important. And especially in the areas of love, attachment to other people. Yeah? This is a very powerful attachment. This is also part of the sensory realm. But if you have a partner who is incredibly dear to you, or your children, of course, are very, very dear to you. You will do almost anything to hold on to that partner, to hold on to those children, to hold on to whatever in that realm. You will do anything, and I can almost guarantee you, to you that you will also do bad things in the name of holding on to that. We talk often here about things like crimes of passion. Crimes of passion are when you're even willing to kill somebody because you are so immersed in that relationship that if they leave you, you actually kill them as a consequence. We hear about these things all the time. You go, you go crazy out of attachment and love and desire for other people. This is the reality of the world. So we have to be very, very careful because we are all subject to these things. Yeah? We have all been through that. I look back on my own life, I can very well see the kind of attachments, not so much anymore, but certainly in the past, like when I was a layperson, it's a long time ago now, 30 years ago, <laughs> since I was a layperson. Uh, but uh, the memory is very strong still. I know what it feels like uh, to have your heart bound because of a relationship with another person like that. Uh, it's incredibly powerful and painful and difficult to deal with. Uh. We all know those things. Uh. So that's why we have to be careful, because we are subject to these things, whether we think we are or not. Uh. All right. So, this is a drawback of sensual pleasures to do with lives to come, a mass of suffering caused by sensual pleasures. So, uh, here now the Buddha has uh, kind of given us uh, uh, this, all these uh, details about sensual pleasures, uh, and then I think the sutta goes on for quite a bit further. But uh, I'm not going to go into that now. It goes into the discussion about Jains and all kind of things. Uh, but this is the uh, kind of the main thing that I wanted to focus on, uh, to give you an idea. And you can see it's very straightforward, right? It's actually very simple. Uh, and the main thing that we have to do, what is hard, is to notice these things in your life, to see that they're actually there. Uh, very often we forget about the downside. We don't want to see it when it happens. Uh, and then because of that, we lack that clarity. Uh, we lack the honesty to see things squarely as they actually are. So opening up to this is important. And when you start to see that, you start to change your priorities. Your priorities become different, and you focus more on the spiritual aspect of existence. Living well, doing the right thing, having more compassion and understanding in the world. That's why you then move gradually as a consequence. This is the purpose of these kind of teachings, to lead you in the right way. So, we're going to start a new sutta in a second. Maybe this is a good place to stop rather than, there's only got five minutes before the supposed breaks. Let's take a five minute meditation break now and then we'll come back to the next sutta shortly.
Okay, everyone. So uh, uh, we. I feel sorry for. Ooh, I feel sorry to wake up the person who is snoring a little bit. Uh, who <laughs> I would like to leave them in peace to sleep more. <laughs> You okay, Wayne? Are you feeling a bit sick, or are you are you all right? Need to learn to drive. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, very good. Yeah, please just do whatever you whatever you feel, feel is right. You know, huh? so look after yourself. Okay, everyone. So, any uh, further questions or comments uh, about this? Uh, one over here in the front. Um, Venerable Sir, I I have a question on these two things called the five senses mm -hmm. and the sense of self. Uh, I, I'm not even sure whether the direction of my question is correct. If not, I uh, would request that I be corrected. Does, does this, which one comes first? The, sense, the five senses come first. And then they are working, give rise to this sense of self, or there is already the sense of self, then only there is this five senses. H how do they correlate with, with each other? Which one comes first? Yeah. Is this even the right question? <laughs> Thank you. They usually come together. You can't really say one comes first, the other one comes afterwards, because they exist together. When there is the five senses, there's always the sense of self. When there's a sense of self, you don't always have the five senses. You can have only one sense, for example. So, for example, if you go into a deep meditation state, the ordinary five senses are gone, only the mind is left. And that mind will also have a sense of self, but there will always be some sense left, yeah? even if it's just the mind. So, as long as there is some sense there, not necessarily the five senses, but at least the mind, then there will also be the sense of self. And the sense of self, they were at the very least, there will be the mind present. It goes together, they cannot exist without each other. If you get rid of the sense of self, then the mind and the five senses will eventually also disappear, will go. They cannot exist without the sense of self. Yeah? Yeah. Please, yeah. Oh, hi, Bhante. Um, may I kindly uh, clarify that uh, if one is go about um, practicing yes. bhavana, mm -hmm. the aspect of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, um, and that we have a choice between vipassana or samatha, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, specifically if samatha is uh, anapanasati, and if uh, the vipassana, it's let's say the Mahasi Sayadaw mm -hmm. method, uh, which one would uh, Hajan <laughs> advise? Because okay, thinking that uh, you know setting the right footing yeah. is the right one. And if what does the sutta say about this? That is subject? exactly the right question. That's the question I wanted to hear. What does the sutta say? Oh. That is the, always the right question to ask. Yeah. It is not the right question is not is Mahasi right or is Goenka right? The right question is uh, what does the Sutta say? And that's always the right question to ask. So congratulations for at least asking the right question. If you ask the right question, there's a chance that we will get on the right track. So that's that's, that's wonderful. I'm not going to talk too much about this because uh, this is kind of a little bit as beyond what we're doing now. But uh, essentially, what the Buddha says is basically he says that anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, fulfills the four satipatthanas. Uh, and the four satipatthanas are really what meditation practice is about. So all you have to do is anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. That's all you really have to do. And that is both samatha and vipassana. Remember, one of the things in the modern world, we talk about samatha meditation and vipassana meditation as if there are two kinds of meditation. The Buddha never talks about samatha meditation. He never talks about vipassana meditation. There is no such things in the suttas. He does talk about samatha, he does talk about vipassana, but these are the results of meditation. They're not methods of meditation. Huh? And that is a very important distinction. Huh? So if you practice mindfulness of breathing, uh, you get two results. Uh, two results are samatha and vipassana. So mindfulness of breathing is both calm and insight, or both calm and clear seeing. Uh, 
And so, uh, the, um, so what about the Mahasya technique or the Gwenka technique? Are they Samatha or Vipassana? Well, if they work, they are both Samatha and Vipassana. Because the Samatha Vipassana always has to go together. You cannot have one without the other. Why? Because when you feel calm, you will see clearly. When you see things clearly, because what you are seeing is that you are seeing Dukkha, it means you will give up things, you will feel calm as a consequence. Calm and clear seeing, clear seeing is my translation for Vipassana, have to go together. They cannot be distinguished from each other. They must go together. So all you have to do is do meditation practice and it will give rise to both of those results. And if it doesn't give rise to both, it doesn't give rise to any one of them. That is, as I understand the word of the Buddha, um, there is a booklet on the internet, internet which is called uh, uh, Why Samatha and Vipassana uh, are inseparable. Uh, and it is written by a certain monk called Ajahn Brahmali. So, <laughs> so, so check it, search for it on the internet, you will find it and you can read it and I go into this in much more detail. Why Samatha and Vipassana are inseparable. Yeah. Yeah. Ajahn, uh, yeah. if there's no other question, uh, I would like to ask, uh, since yeah. Ajahn emphasized hammer down on the uh, importance of uh, having faith in the teaching on rebirth, yeah. right? And uh, uh, for us uh, lay people, we, we, we kind of take that in intellectually. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's kind of different from knowing that uh, the rebirth for certain. Yeah, yeah, we can absolutely. read a lot of books and yeah. uh, we can accept the teaching. But then, um, how to say, I, I don't think it will be some, some sort of solid um, uh, faith, confidence on, on, on that and does Ajahn uh, recommend uh, past life regressions, that, those sort of things so that we can actually yeah. know for sure that um, rebirth is uh, actually there. Yeah, I, I mean if you like to play around in that area and you think it's fun, you can do past life regression. Yeah, yeah. But remember it is very, the results are very uncertain with past life regression, very very uncertain and a lot of the time it's just the mind confabulating things because the mind is full of dreams and ideas and images and all this kind of stuff. Uh, most of the time it is useless. Sometimes it may re lead to something positive. Uh, so if you are interested and you think it might be good fun, you can do it. Uh, but don't do it and think that you're going to get confirmation for past lives. You're not going to get that. Uh, except maybe in some cases. There are some exceptional cases where it may happen. Uh, but I think just, I would, if I, for me, it is more powerful just to read some of the stories of people, you know, the stories you hear about people, like the book I was mentioning the other day, the book called After, uh, and that sort of thing. And when you, to me, when I read these books and I hear ordinary people talk about their experiences, uh, it's very hard for me to dismiss it. Uh, this book was written by the scientist called Bruce Grayson, and he goes through all the various kinds of explanations. Uh, and he says that at the end of this whole thing, going through all the various explanations, there is a re residue that cannot really be explained away. Huh? Yeah? It's very, very hard to come up with an explanation for these things. Huh? And so to me, these things are, why should we not think it is, has to do with rebirth? Yeah? To me, it's kind of the, uh, it, and the reason why, we, wh why there is so much resistance uh, is not because the evidence is bad, uh, the reason why there's so much resistance is because our culture leans against it, goes against it. If you were living in a culture where rebirth was accepted, this would be taken as evidence straight away. But because our culture actually goes against these things, we set a very high bar for the kind of evidence that we accept. Yeah, and it's sometimes too high. I, I know that some of the evidence that was collected by Ian Stevenson with the recollection of you know children recollecting past lives. Some of the people who looked at us said, this is a h much higher standard of evidence than almost in any other science. Uh, but still it gets rejected, and the reason is because the cultural bias against these kind of things. Uh, and this is what makes it difficult sometimes. Uh, so, uh, t you know, I, I think that uh, we just need to, I guess, one of the nice things that w I would really love to hear if anyone here has had any experiences like that. If you feel like writing it down and you want to be anonymous, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but it would be wonderful, and especially if in, 
in your Buddhist community, you can talk about these things. Because once you start to hear these stories from people around you, yeah, who've had something like this, uh, it starts to open up your mind in a new way. Because these are people you can trust. Uh, these are people you know. If it happens to your family members, yeah, or especially, of course, if it happens to yourself, then it's very different. Uh, but talking about these things, may, and, not, and actually really listening to people, see what's going on with them, uh, actually can be very, very interesting. Yeah. Sometimes we are afraid of opening up about these things because we think other people are going to think we are nuts, we are, we are kind of really crazy. Yeah. But that's a really, that's terrible when that happens. Yeah? Like we are afraid to talk about these things uh, because uh, actually they can be very, very useful to, uh, to open up our minds to, to something larger. Uh. So just, uh, I would encourage us, keep on looking uh, on the internet. There are some great stories. There's a beautiful story. You, you may have heard of Anita Morjani, a very famous story. Uh, she was um, in Hong Kong and she lived in, living in Singapore in Hong Kong. She was a uh, Indian descent, and she had this very powerful near-death experience that completely transformed her life. She became a completely different person afterwards. Very inspiring. She gave a TED talk on that later on, uh, and it's on TED, been viewed by millions of people, uh, Anita Morjani. So there are many things like that that are very, very fascinating. And uh, after a while, it becomes kind of uh, almost second nature. Of course there is rebirth. Uh, why don't we believe in this? Well, we only don't believe in it because it goes against so much of our contemporary culture. It's just the bias that we have in our culture. Uh, and that is the biggest problem, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. All right, so now it is 2.30. What does that mean? I, I'm, I lost my track here. We have a break. Okay, let's have a break. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see you back again at 2.45. Uh.